For this project, I chose to visit the Franklin Conservatory Botanical Gardens that surround the Franklin Conservatory in Columbus, Ohio. And here I found many examples of ornamental plants that had evidence of disease. And in this presentation, I will provide arguments as to what I believe the causal agents of these diseases are and why. And for each proposed causal agent and disease, I will recommend a plan of action for disease management. The first plant I will be discussing is orpine, also known as Hylotelephium telephium, formerly known as sedum telephium. It is a perennial succulent that grows about 20 inches tall and can spread up to one foot. This plant has pinkish flowers that appear in dense clusters above bright green leaves. The symptoms that I found on this plant that I believe indicated some sort of disease were as followed. As you can see in this video, there are necrotic spots on the sedum leaves. These necrotic spots seem to be surrounded by a yellow chlorotic halo. I believe that this video shows that the tips of the leaves also seem to have a yellow chlorosis to them. Some of the flowers of the plant are also blighted. In this photo, towards the crown of the plant, it is almost noticeable that there is white mycelium near the soil line. I had some trouble finding mycelium on this plant, but I do believe that this photo shows some on the crown of the plant. I hypothesize that the causal agent is Pythium or Phytophthora, and the disease may be crown rot. I believe this because I can see chlorosis on the leaves, and this is common for crown rot of sedums. Some mycelium can also be seen on the crown of the plant. To get a better idea of the disease, it would have been helpful to see the status of the roots. If the fine roots turned mushy and sloughed off, leaving mostly thicker, older roots behind, I would be more confident that the causal agent of this disease was Pythium or Phytophthora. Assuming my diagnosis was correct, I would propose that this plant should be grown in full sun on well-drained soil with a neutral to slightly alkaline pH. In order to control this pathogen, good drainage and water management are essential. It is also important to not over-fertilize. For new plants acquired from other nurseries, they should be inspected and placed in a quarantine to be monitored for disease development for a few weeks before being introduced to the rest of the plants in the greenhouse or surrounding areas. The second plant that I found was cutleaf coneflower, or Rudbeckia lacinata. This herbaceous perennial usually grows three to eight feet tall and it branches occasionally in the upper half. The middle leaf of this plant usually has three to seven large lobes and all of the leaves of this plant have a tendency to droop. Though I did not find many symptoms, I do believe that this photo shows some yellowing chlorosis on the tips of the leaves. The signs I found, however, are abundant. As can be seen in many of the photos that I included in this presentation, there is an abundance of white mycelium on the upper and lower portions of the leaves. I also believe that there is small ovate pycnidia found on the underside of the leaves. I hypothesize that the causal agent of this disease is erisith or sparotheca, which both can lead to powdery mildew. I believe this because there appears to be a dusting of white mycelium on the upper and underside of the leaves, which is characteristic of powdery mildew. The spots are not surrounded by yellow chlorosis, so downy mildew is unlikely. The pycnidia is also characteristic of this disease. For a proposed treatment of powdery mildew, I would recommend removing the diseased parts of the plant and planting in an area that is not too shady and has good air circulation. Cleaning up the beds in the fall will be helpful so the disease cannot overwinter. Other preventative measures can include planting resistant varieties. And finally, one trick that may require a more dedicated gardener would be to spray the affected leaves with urine diluted with four parts water, according to many eccentric home gardeners. The next plant is nannyberry, or Viburnum lentago, which is usually grown as a large shrub or small tree that can reach 15 to 20 feet high, and it is known for its dark green leaves that turn a maroonish red color in the fall. The symptoms I believe I found on this tree 
were necrotic slash dark spots and leaf curling. The signs, I believe, were an abundance of mycelium on the upper sides of the leaves. For this plant, I also believe that the causal agent was either erysphe or sparatheca, and the disease was powdery mildew. I believe this because it is common for powdery mildew to become apparent in viburnums like this one in August or September, which is exactly when I visited this particular tree. The powdery mycelium is characteristic of this causal agent, and the leaf cupping is very characteristic of this disease on viburnum. The treatment for powdery mildew on a tree like this would be different than an ornamental plant that can be easily moved or replaced. This disease is more common in trees when it is planted in a shady or humid area that has low air circulation. It is hard to get rid of, and once it is established, it will not usually harm the tree, so it will only be a cosmetic issue. To deal with this disease, it is best to apply fungicides when the first powdery mildew appears on the leaves. And as I said before, removing the debris in the fall will help destroy inoculum for the following growing season and stop the spread of the disease. The fourth plant I found while walking around the gardens was an Ohio buckeye, or Aeschylus glabra. The Ohio buckeye is a member of the horse chestnut family and usually ranges from medium shrubs to large trees. These trees are usually known for their thick and luscious canopies that provide immense shade. However, it is obvious that this specific Ohio buckeye has little to no leaves left. I believe that this early senescence is a symptom of the disease. On the remaining leaves, it can also be seen that there is the symptom of necrosis and necrotic spots. I could not identify any signs when looking at the tree. I hypothesized that the causal agent is Nyardia esculi, or Nyardia leaf blotch. I believe that this is the causal agent because recently in Ohio there has been continual wet weather, and this is the perfect environmental condition for this fungal pathogen to infect. Disease symptoms appear as lesions on the leaflets that are surrounded by yellow chlorotic halos. The lesions are small and reddish brown and are bounded by the leaf veins. In these photos, I believe that the blotches are contained by the veins. This is why I believe it separates leaf blotch from leaf scorch. The only current recommendations for management of this disease are fungicide applications. There, however, are no fungicides that will provide protection for the entire growing season, so repeated applications may be required. Because leaf scorch and leaf blotch are very similar to each other, I decided to also include the management for leaf scorch. The Ohio buckeye tree is in the horse chestnut family, as stated before, and these trees do not tolerate high lights. By planting this tree as an understory tree, leaf scorch can be avoided. So, it can be assumed that if the tree is already in a well-shaded area and it still is portraying these symptoms, then it is probably leaf blotch. For the final plant, I found a bottle brush buckeye, or Asculus parviflora. The bottle brush buckeye is a shrub that has long, fluffy, white flower clusters. In one of these photos, you can see the stem that used to hold the flower clusters. The symptoms that I believe I can see in this plant are chlorosis contained by the leaf veins, necrotic tips surrounded by a yellow chlorosis, and as seen in many of these pictures, I believe that the leaves are wilting. One sign that I was able to find on this plant was an abundance of pycnidia on the undersides of some of the leaves. Just like the buckeye tree, I believe that the causal agent was Inyardia asculi. I believe that this was the causal agent because the necrotic spots are reddish brown to brown and are bordered by a yellow band that merges gradually with the green tissue of the leaves. And just like before, the lesions appear to be limited by the veins I also believe that this is the causal agent because there are some petioles that appear to have become infected with small reddish round spots that elongate on the petioles. 
There is also globus pycnidia on the leaf surfaces. This is characteristic of the disease when it is proliferous on a plant. I was surprised to find that this bottle brush has symptoms of Yngardia leaf blotch because it is not common in bottle brush buckeyes. I do believe, however, that this bottle brush buckeye is affected by this disease, mainly because of the petiole lesions, which are extremely characteristic of this disease. As for treatment for disease management, I would recommend to clean the debris of the plant in the fall for the following season. And as I said before, consistent fungicide applications during the growing season are essential to treating this disease, especially if it has already taken over the plant, as appears here.